Hi, and welcome to Weldon Live for Friday, January 20th with a ton of stuff to cover. It's a triple hat trick, Anglo macro type of day. We look at macro data from Australia, from the UK, and from Canada. We work in Canada as kind of a bonus macro in today's stock index focus. And we'll start with that. It's kind of the equity sweet spot here where the data doesn't, you know, still shows reasonable growth in final demand in terms of retail sales and inflation that is not going down, but not really breaking out either within, without any kind of real broad-based price push in Canada, one of the few places and the one out of the only, the only one out of these three for sure. Uh, so that gives it an equity sweet spot. The TSX 60 at a new high today and a particular interest was strength in gold mining shares in Canada, particularly some of the junior, more risky, lower price gold miners. We'll work that in in today's metal market focus. In our global macro, it's about Australia and the UK, employment and inflation, and particularly inflation, and particularly as it relates to the UK, that feeds into our gilt market focus today. Should we be short the gilts again? We think the answer is yes. We'll be looking for a price point to get involved in that. And on the flip side of that, with expanding uh, global bond yield differentials in favor of the UK, uh, could there be a bottom in place here in Sterling with uh, upside reversal weeks uh, in Sterling against a handful of major currencies? We'll take a look at that. Energy today, natural gas, a down week, warm weather in the Northeast demand uh, centers, uh, the reason why, and more weakness could be expected there, perhaps as much as, uh, say, 20 to 30 cents at a minimum. Orange juice leaking and really beaten to a pulp is really what it is this week, and uh, you'll see why when we get to the charts there. You know, here's our little write-up again for the PDF readers. Not going to go through that in terms of the video. We'll go right to global macro. We'll start down, we'll start down under Australian labor market on the quiet side. I mean, it has been, you know, kind of stopping and starting in terms of strength. This is a kind of a stopping month. It's not weak. It's not strong. It's kind of balanced. Employment was up, but so too was unemployment. The jobless rate rose as people came back into the labor force, uh, but the participation rate also rose that re reflects the fact that people are actually getting jobs. So from that perspective, kind of neither here nor there, uh, the overall uh, total employment figure did reach another all-time high and note the comeback here in full-time employment which had fallen below kind of the the relative growth pace in part-time employment you want to see full-time employment employment outpacing part-time that has been the case for the last several years in uh, in australia but for the last few months it hasn't so the strength in uh, full-time relative to part-time was a sign of uh, positivity uh, there for the from the macro side in australia the unemployment rate does tick up it is back above the five-year average it'll be half to be watched but it's kind of interesting in the sense that maybe it keeps the rba at bay in terms of thoughts of any kind of rate hike in fact some people say it keeps the door open for a rate cut the participation rate rose but in terms of a rate cut we don't think so not when the inflation expectations from the melbourne institute jump like they did here in january 4.3 up from 3.4 i mean it's a massive turnaround in terms of a lack of inflation expectations to now significant inflation expectations. Uh, and so got to keep that in mind in terms of how that applies to monetary policy down under. Really, the story of the day is the UK. The UK inflation numbers, the UK employment numbers, really the inflation data was the key. The year-over-year -year rate of CPI jumps to 1.6 above the five-year average. You can see the acceleration. This last two months looks almost parabolic in terms of its slope to the upside perhaps even more troubling is ppi not really necessarily although certainly input prices at 15.6 percent highest level since 2011 but more so output prices and just like we talked about yesterday in the u.s where prices received uh from the philadelphia federal reserve survey was really interesting uh, for you know we're starting not only to see just anecdotal signs of you know pr some pricing power uh we're also seeing signs of it in terms of some of the data now uh it's the same thing here with this uk number on output prices uh 2.7 the highest rate since uh really uh, early 2012 and look at the five-year average has rolled to the upside is actually accelerating to the upside and you with this kind of move over the last couple of months have violated the downtrend line that goes all the way back to the 2008 pre-crisis peak in inflation in the uk 
These numbers were eye-opening for sure. Uh, within that context, the number of unemployed fell again uh, after, I think it was, uh, what did I write here, uh, uh, eight of the last nine months. But if you go back, that eight of the last nine months pretty represents the entire uh, gain over the last five years when you're still down 50 of the last 60 months uh, from that perspective, also the decline was more than the five-year average decline. So from that perspective, uh, significant in terms of uh, reflecting some kind of strength. The unemployment rate holds at its low here of 4.8, making 2016 uh, one of only three years in which UK unemployment has been below 5% for multiple months. Uh, that includes 2004 and 2005. Not since then have we seen that kind of uh, strength. Weekly earnings rise, another sign of inflation. And in the case where, you know, in the U.S., you know, real wages are going down. And to the perspective, uh, uh, U.K. Has, still has a real uh, wage, you know, uh, cushion against inflation. Uh, this is really interesting. And we know that U.K. tends to lead in terms of, you know, not only usually interest rates, and it hasn't clearly in this case in terms of the Bank of England, but in terms of bond yields and in terms of inflation, uh, maybe it still has the chance to kind of grab the torch of leadership here from the U.S., from that perspective, we look at the wage gains of 2.8%. This includes bonuses, year-over-year -year rate, kind of violating a flat downtrend line we could have drawn here. But note the five-year average has been up since 2014, held in this little kind of downdraft. And there was a lot of uh, fa special factors that contributed to being higher here and then lower here. And now you're kind of back to what would be a trending pace to the upside, watching that high 3.2 from 2015, likely to be taken out. Now, some publicity around retail sales being weak, and they were. The thing about it is you got to keep in mind, this comes off one of the strongest months ever. I mean, this is the seventh single deepest single month uh, decline ever, but this is against the 10th largest single month increase ever. And you know, a lot of these single month declines come off of huge increases. So from that perspective, don't read too, too much into that. Uh, you know, and the year over year rate at 43 it's still more than respectable. Anything above 4% is strong in the UK. I mean, frankly, you know, anything above 3 could be considered strong. The uptrend line's intact. The five-year average is at a new high. From that perspective, retail sales were not weak. We did note that in household goods, though, uh, some slowing. So from that perspective, this area needs to be watched. But overall, the numbers were strong in the UK, particularly from the inflation side, also from the wage side, back to strength in employment. And on the back of that, it feeds into our focus in fixed income, which is on the UK. The December uh, 2017 three-month sterling deposit rate futures, the implied yield up to almost 56 basis points, back above 50. The base rate at 25, you're establishing beyond the normal spread that you might see on the deposit rate. So kind of from that context, you could argue you're beginning to price in a tightening. And we have said this for the last year, that the next move in the UK is not going to be another easing. It's going to be a rate hike. And now that is looking increasingly uh, like that is the way it's going to go. Uh, you note the uh, long-term 200-day moving average to the upside and violating the downtrend line. It goes all the way back to the middle of 2015 sterling uh, on the uh, short-term deposit rates on the upside as our sterling bond yields. The five-year yield pressing against the 52-week. If it turns here, you have massive bullish divergence, bullish meaning higher yields. And from that perspective, an outside upside reversal week this week in the five-year gilt. Moreover, the 10-year looks even worse outside upside reversal week and now potentially against significant bullish again meaning higher yield divergence threatening the 30-year downtrend line i mean so this was real technical damage done in the gilt market curve steepening the 10-year two-year and even to a greater degree the 10-year five-year look at this move it's over 60 basis points uh, just since the summer that's pretty significant at the end of the day we want to uh, you know consider and you know look for a place really i mean we're already, we're already considering unless you get a big reversal the other way next week uh to sell the 10-year uk gilt futures we've been short that caught this move down got out pretty nicely you get below 123 25 it's a breakdown we don't think we want to wait that long so we'll be looking at this specifically on monday morning uh note the rally here too right in between the moving average which continue to converge to a potential negative uh, turn which never even occurred during this big price decline this was significant price decline here that took place uh, so from that perspective, gilts looking bearish. Foreign exchange, the flip side of gilts being bearish means you, higher UK yields. And in this case, you know, uh, widening spreads against other countries, in this case, Germany and Japan in particular. Here's the UK-German 10-year spread. You can see, I mean, here's the uh, Brexit decline. 
Okay, uh, and you know, people were saying it's going to narrow to zero. I mean, that was kind of crazy. I mean, you actually narrowed perfectly into the zone between the Fibonacci's, 50 and 61 of this entire move. It's A, B, C in nature. This is all looks like a big correction. You're back above the 200-day moving average, which has turned up. You get above 115, you'll be above this low as well. You'll be above the breakdown point. That calls for you know further widening. That's sterling positive against the euro, and uh, you weren't far from the sterling lows, and all of a sudden. It's an upside reversal week in Sterling. You can see it in terms of the candlestick. It's also an inverted head and shoulders bottoming pattern uh, with a clear-cut neckline at 120.45, which plays off perfectly against the 52-week moving average at 121 in line with a long-term stochastic roll to the upside. Pretty interesting, Sterling against the euro. Same thing in uh, terms of UK gilts against JGB, the 10-year tenor uh, to the upside here. This is a new high. I mean, this is a new high uh, going back to the second quarter of last year. You can see both moving averages now trending higher. You had a nice little correction, and boom, back to the upside, favoring uh, sterling, widening UK yield premium. And as a result, same thing. I mean, an upside reversal week in sterling yen. And we have a positive, uh, shorter long-term uh, oscillator reading. And that's really interesting. This is a more sensitive one. It's kind of a, it's not necessarily a trending one. It's kind of telling you where turning points are. And it's suggesting above 148.50 uh, in uh, sterling uh, against the uh, yen would be bullish. And we see that in terms of the 52-week moving average as well. Could even see a breakout in sterling against the dollar. Uh, that would be more predicated upon the dollar potentially weakening and some give up of, you know, maybe the U.S. and the Fed being the leader here if U.K. inflation takes kind of more of a center stage from that perspective. You see here the mini preliminary breakout this week in the uh, uh, British pound against the U.S. dollar. And there is potential here for a major double bottom. I mean, this is in terms of uh, the futures market, five ticks. I mean, that's barely anything. That's a major closing double bottom against a long-term stochastic signal potentially bottoming in a sterling across the board. Now, we uh, did discuss, uh, you know, that we bring in our third macro with Canada. We talked about it, strength uh, without accelerating inflation, retail sales, oops, retail sales here um, uh, dropped to 3%, uh, back below the five-year average. But, you know, it's kind of mid-range in terms of a growth rate, so it's neither here nor there. You had areas of strength against area of, areas of weakness. I mean, for the month, furniture was strong. Look at the... Uh, you know, look at the year over year rate in furniture sales. I mean, it's very strong. Uh, same thing in terms of building and, and materials. Uh, so from that perspective, there are areas of strength. Uh, used car dealers were down and auto parts were down. Uh, but on the flip side of that, so too was food was a big contributor. Now we know what we think about that. That's going to change. Gasoline, interesting. These are volume, not price-based numbers, which make them much more interesting from our perspective relative to the U.S. Uh, shoes were down and you saw sporting goods. So from that perspective, again, kind of balanced, but some areas of strength. I mean, you can't deny the strength here in furniture sales and uh, electronic and appliance sales and building material sales. So overall, not a bad number. Uh, and in terms of CPI, uh, you know, up for the month, but still below the two-year average, still below the previous high, still below the downtrend line, and not breaking out and accelerating like we're seeing inflation rates in a lot of other countries. From that perspective, it kind of puts you in the sweet spot. You think you're going to get rate cuts down the road. Strength in retail sales and final demand is not bad, and particularly in several areas. You know, and from that perspective, you know, the uh, dynamic in terms of inflation, clothing and transportation, and you still got food, recreation and beverages down. I mean, food, again, a big thing uh, from that perspective. Um, so, but we also know service inflation was higher, but X energy was, was lower. So, you know, again, kind of a mixed bag, which puts you in the monetary sweet spot where it's, you know, maintaining thought processes about future rate hikes, which helps the banks. They were number two in the performance list in the TSX uh, stock market today. Number one was materials, though. And from that perspective, you see the move in the TSX 60 to a new record high today. Uh, and you can see the move very clearly here with the push above previous high of 920.51. You can see it on the weekly chart too, up 26% in the last 52 weeks. Moving average is just turning bullishly on a long-term basis. And on the closing basis, you can see clearly above 900, breaking out to new high, the TSX 60. In metals, we follow that up with first a look at inauguration years. Just thought this was a cool chart from Bloomberg. Uh, inauguration years tend to be bullish for gold. Here's the returns, okay? From that perspective, gold is kind of cycled back to the upside. You have the moving averages both rising. You're up about 8% from the lows, and you have buying coming back into the market. 
you know, from that perspective. Now, what's interesting is when we tie that into our Canadian stock focus today, you see the rise in mining shares in Canada. Yamana has been one of the best and one of the worst in both ways and is now actually at a new uh, daily close only high. And this is kind of a very interesting U pattern here. Uh, breaking out in on balance volume. It does have overhead resistance that needs to get through, but this is an interesting pattern, as is particularly Gold Corp, which is just breaking out. Case closed. Downtrend line, both moving averages, including the 200-day, with a nice bottoming pattern. Similarly, to Seiko, low stock. I mean, this thing was at a low of 36, you know, 0.36 Canadian dollars down here, uh, trading uh, in, to in uh, Toronto, excuse me. Uh, but from that perspective, I mean, this thing's up like, you know, I mean, what, like 500% up to like 168, keeping in mind. We're not necessarily recommending a stock. I mean, if you really want to be, play it safe, I mean, Gold Corp looks good uh, from that perspective. We also like, though, if you want to take a little more risk, Continental. This is an interesting chart pattern from 131. You can see the bullish longer term dynamic in terms of the trend has been broken, the moving averages have turned up. You vacillated in this area now, breaking out to the upside on the back of a potential move higher in gold. That's pretty interesting, Continental. And then finally, one of our you know, favorite charts uh, from last year played this to the upside, a little, little late in getting out, but who wasn't, uh, was First Majestic Silver. This is right here. This is actually a new up move closing high on a weekly basis. You held in the Fibonacci's on the on-balance volume. You're above the 52-week moving average, which has not crossed below the uh, two-year. You know, volume is still good, and you're still up year over year. I mean, you, I mean uh, Frank, you get this thing above 1250 love it. From this perspective, Continental First Majestic might be a nice one-two gold silver punch play in Canada. Energy, it's about natural gas, the continuation of warm weather in the demand centers in the northeast U.S., uh, really wreaking havoc with this market. Uh, you know, there was a slightly larger than expected drawdown, but not enough to buoy the market. And from that perspective, back below the 200-day moving average with a bad day on Friday, bearish divergence here opens the door for move below $3. Probably going to test the moving average crossover level here down around 287 like we said, that gives you about uh, about 30 cents of potential downside in natural gas, although it could be more. And it could be more if you start to see things like the swap rates and the forwards really come under greater pressure. Here's the 12-month forward swap almost into contango. I mean, the February is about to go off the board in the not-too-distant future, uh, so that's a sign of weakness. And then if you take it to a step further, next year's February contract I mean, this is really toppy. I mean, look at a 38%, boom, then a 50% against the longer-term downtrend implies if you get below 342 in this contract, it's a renewal of a long-term downtrend, and the impetus would be selling by longs because look at where on-balance volume is. This is a widely owned contract. There's a lot of people still kind of clinging to a bullish natural gas play. We did for a while. We were lucky enough to get out you know, around the uh, turn of the year, but from that perspective, this looks pretty dangerous to the downside. Also representing that is the UNG. It looks terrible. I mean, look at the high level of on-balance volume here, and the technical breakdown this week below 770 with bearish divergence would be bad technical action. And then finally, closing out the week, we look at orange juice. It said beaten to a pulp. And look at this thing. You know, we did look at it right around here and said beware of this technical danger. And, man, did that play out. Look at the downside roll here. And look at the carnage this week on the weekly chart, looking at 150 here probably in orange shoes before it's over. That's it for today. Oh, wait, we got, whoa, we got Trade Lab. Forgot we're doing Trade Lab now, too. Really nothing we, you know, we don't want to necessarily change anything. We're watching the S&P 500 very closely for potential exit from our stock position. Uh, and we will keep an eye also on copper for any potential disappointment. Uh, in terms of the thought process that, you know, the Trump election drove the stock market higher, drove the industrial metals higher, now waiting for action. If it doesn't come quickly enough to satiate the market's expectation, you could have a realignment of reality and expectation, and that could be a corrective thing uh, for the industrial metals and for the stocks. We'll keep a close eye on it. Stay tuned next week, uh, as I'm sure we'll be focusing on this, uh, not only next week, but in the weeks to come. That's it for today. That's it for this week. Have a safe, joyous, and happy weekend. We're back at you on Monday.